Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, good evening, and it's fantastic to see so many people here on a Friday night, and I think it shows just how popular chocolate is that this is the first day of the World Cup, and it's a Friday evening, and apparently we could have sold out at least the same again, so it is absolutely fantastic, and I think the end of last year's event, for those of you who were here when we suggested chocolate, there was a big yes please, um, we've got an even better surprise for you later on what we're going to do next year, we hope if they allow us back. <laughs> we'll give you a hint. It starts with C. Yeah. And it's not Coca-Cola. So, before I start, my name's Clive Page, and, and we really need to thank the British Pharmacological Society, who um, not only have supported tonight's event, but since last year when we did curry with you, we've now been out and into schools with the same event. And we went to several academies in London, had a whale of a time and ended up in Southall, which we had people making curry at the back and eating it. So it was, I think, fantastic. We're going to do more of it because I think it's something that seems to work quite well. So again, thanks to the British Pharmacological Society for really thinking that this is worthwhile supporting. Um, you've met me before, or some of you have. Mark and Andrea, again, uh, are, are no strangers to this particular audience, you'll notice that they're standing well apart because as you can see they're all things that might go fizz bang. We have a new addition to the team this, this year, Keith Herdman, and Keith is a chocolatier from Thorntons. Now, lest you think that you should not concentrate this evening, we're going to have a little quiz at the end, and one of the prizes is two kilograms of Madagascar chocolate. <laughs> I can hear you salivating already. <laughs> Another prize is of a very rare one kilogram of Cuban chocolate. Now, by the way, I'm the only person who knows anything about the answers, so I'm probably going to win all three of them. And then we have a DVD, an extremely rare white... This is chocolate from Switzerland made from wild cocoa, which, again, I have the bag. But we are going to have a little prize, and somebody or some few of you are going to actually take some of these home later on. Um, you may ask why you've been given the tissues. It's not to dry up after these two have made a mess. It is actually in order to hold samples of chocolate because we have six very different chocolates that you're going to get to taste this evening. But there is one rule. When the chocolate comes in, you're to put it on the tissue. You're not allowed to touch it, put it in your mouth until they say so. And when you do put it in your mouth, the whole part of the experiment is it has to melt you're not to chew it. Anybody seen doing anything is ejected. Is that right? Yes. Is that no right? chewing tonight. Now, we can see the popularity of chocolate. Does anybody know how much the UK spends on chocolate per year? A guess, please. Lots. <laughs> she gets first prize, I hope, for sure. Well, I actually picked this up the other day. It's £3.5 billion. Pounds. That's a lot of chocolate. It's a lot of kilograms, and I'm reliably informed by my colleague here from Thornton's that the average Brit consumes, is it seven, seven, kilos. seven kilos of chocolate a year? Now, I've just shown you what two looks like. <laughs> That's the average. Maybe the lady in yellow, you... No? That's the average, but... These guys are going to show you perhaps why you should be a little bit more careful eating too much of it because of what's actually in some of it. Um, as a clue, yeah. I'd just like to show you the, this, the basest of all s substances, and I hope nobody's here from Tesco, but <coughs> Tesco lard might give you a clue. Anyway, so I, without further ado, I'm going to hand over Don't to Keith. It. Don't eat it who is going to start off by really giving a very brief overview of going from a chocolate bean to a chocolate bar. And then we will start with the eating. Now, during the session, as we've done with previous years, if there are questions, there will be a chance later on, there'll be a roving, mic roving microphone, we will give you a chance to ask questions. So, Keith, over to you. Now, this is the man with the best job in the world, I think. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clive. Good evening, everybody. So, the chocolate path. Most of us have been weaned on chocolate from an early age and feel that we have a fairly good impression of what chocolate should look and taste like, despite the fact that the British alone 
eat more than seven kilos of chocolate a head each year. Not many people know its history or the variety of tastes and flavors to be explored. With the notable exception of wine, nothing we eat or drink has acquired such a fanatical following. History tells us that notable chocoholics include Marie Antoinette, the Marquis de Sade, and Casanova, so you're in good company tonight. <laughs> chocolate is one of the most complex natural substances, more than 300 different chemical elements, producing more than 500 flavor components. That's twice as many as wine. So to the history. The Olmec people in the region of what we know today as the Gulf of Mexico are believed to be the first that cultivated the cocoa tree more than 4,000 years ago. The Maya were the originators of a bitter drink made from cocoa bean, and the Aztec believed that cocoa was a source of spiritual wisdom, and they used cocoa beans for a currency, 10 for a chicken, 100 for a slave, 50 for a wife. They also <laughs> this is true. They also believed that the sun needed a sacrifice of blood each night to revitalize it to shine again the next day. The cocoa tree with its heart-shaped pods made the ideal source of fruit to offer to the gods alongside the somewhat messier human offerings they like to make. Cocoa was taken as a frothy drink at this time. It comprised of water, ground cocoa beans, herbs, and chili. Hernan Cortes arrived in Mexico in 1519, where he quickly realized the economic value of cocoa, both as a foodstuff and as a currency. This was a place where money really did grow on trees. Cocoa then spread across Europe, but it wasn't until the mid-19th century that lint in Switzerland discovered conching, and fries in England discovered the first, or made, developed the first chocolate bar. So on to Theobroma cacao. It's grown in the tropics in a narrow band, 20 degrees north or south of the equator. It takes about five years before the plant gives its first harvest. About, there's two crops per year of the very brightly colored po pollard pods. Each tree gives about 50 pods per year for the life of about 20 years or so. It is a very, very fussy plant indeed, being susceptible for all sorts of nasties. For example, in 1990, Brazil went from being the third biggest producer of cocoa in the world to the 13th. Even today, um, Brazil is a net importer of cocoa. Uh, the plantations were wiped out by a uh, disease called witch's broom. There are three main types of cocoa. There are 250 hybrids, three main types. The first is Criollo, or native. This accounts for 1% to 3% of the world's production. It's a very fine flavored variety, but very susceptible to disease, and it's mainly planted in South America. The second is Forestero, or Foreigner. This is a hardy, high-yielding plant. It produces much coarser tasting chocolate than cocoa, than chocolate made from Criollo beans. It is known as bulk or commodity cocoa. About 80 to 85% of the world's production is main, made from Forestero. It's mainly grown in West Africa, so that's the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, some in East Africa, Tanzania. Trinitario is a cross between the other two, and it counts as a fine flavor bean. It combines the taste of the Criollo and the hardiness of the Forestero. It's mainly grown in Indonesia, the Caribbean, and Madagascar. This accounts for approximately 15% of the world's production. What is the total world's production? I really don't know. I know that the Ivory Coast produces more than a million tons a year. And to put things into perspective, that's a million tons of cocoa. Barry Calibo, which is a big industrial producer, uh, they have a factory in Mexico, which is their third biggest factory. And this supplies the American market. And this one factory alone produces more than 100,000 tons of chocolate a year. So the chocolate path or from bean to bar. Harvesting is still done practically everywhere by hand, machette. The beans are encased in an edible, lychee tasting mucilage. Fermentation is on banana leaves or wooden trays for up to five to six days. This develops the flavor. You notice how everything fermented tastes good. So that's <laughs> cheese, bread, wine, chocolate. Perhaps not, two weeks ago I was judging uh, at a professional cookery competition in, in uh, Wiese, near Belgium, in Belgium, near Brussels. 
And the first dish up of the day at 8.30 in the morning was fermented horse meat with chocolate sauce. He didn't win. <laughs> anyway, drying is immediately after fermentation in the sun, again up to five to six days. In Indonesia, due to the high humidity, and some parts of the Dominican Republic as well, they dry the cocoa beans over a very low fire. And this gives a smoky taste to the chocolate. You may come across this occasionally. Um, cocoa beans can now be stored for, has anybody got an idea how long you could store cocoa beans before you roast them? Not all at once, please. <laughs> a year? Two years. Two years? Six months? Anything else? One you, month. Six, one month. Weeks. Six weeks. You can store the beans at 16 to 20 degrees centigrade for up to four years before, before they are roasted and then processed into, into cocoa, into chocolate. Okay, the, the beans then after this time, or any time up to four years, are roasted at between 130 and 160 degrees centigrade. The acids are driven off, and the flavor obviously is further developed by, by the roasting. Then the next stage is crushing and winnowing the outer shell away. So about 15%, the outer shell is up to 15% of the cocoa bean that is lost. They're then ground to cocoa nibs, and at this stage, it has a recognizably chocolatey character. So we now should be tasting cocoa nibs. Excellent. So we'll get the cocoa nibs in, and it'll take a bit of time to, to show them round. And whilst we're just waiting for that, I thought, since we're not living in Belgium, but we are in the UK, rather than horse with chocolate, my friends here have actually got an ox tongue. Yeah. Is this actually for using with chocolate or? Um, so uh, in a minute we want to show you what's going to happen when you put chocolate in your, in your mouth. And um, um, when I was sort of practicing this later, earlier, um, I, um, I was putting the camera in my mouth so you could see what was going on. And it wasn't a pretty sight. How is that? So um, this is a better sight, isn't it? So we're going to try to, you can't really see. Is that you in can. focus? Oh, you can. Yeah, Not, yeah. that's good. Oh! Look how many, it's really amazing. Uh, this is a cow's tongue. Look how, how bristly it is. So, so I'm probably not, but this is more like our tongue on here, down here. Yeah, that, that's more like our tongue. So anyway, we'll show you what happens when you put chocolate on the tongue in a minute. Um, that's, so this is one of the demos we're gonna do. Uh, let me give you a tour of the demos actually to whet your appetite while we're taking the nibs around. So over here, we're, um, I'm melting some chocolate and some pure cocoa fat, cocoa butter. Can you see that? <laughs> is the color a bit funny on this? It is. Yeah. You're so how fun. many of you, please, this chocolate you're getting, don't put it in your mouth. However tempted you might be, you're very well behaved. <laughs> and the idea of the napkin, by the way, is it's OK for the nibs. It doesn't make much difference, because the nib isn't going to change it properties with if you handle it it's quite resistant to heat but all the other chocolates are going to come round it's important you put it on the napkin because otherwise it will melt in your hand and it, it completely changes the effect that you're trying to taste so that's the idea who's, got who's not got any chocolate at the moment there are f <laughs> so most of you have now got chocolate okay so are they allowed to put it in their mouth yet um yeah, yeah take it away Keith okay so So this is, the, this is the roasted cocoa beans. These are then ground down to nibs, which you have now. I have cheated a little bit here because um, I'm developing for my uh, revered employer a um, chocolate bar with, with these nibs inside. But these are very lightly caramelized. So it's um, got a very, very thin, thin layer of sugar over. But apart from that, that is, that is raw roasted cocoa bean. So you can see even now, just the roasted cocoa beans has got a very recognizably chocolatey character already. These are then even ground even further, very finely, and then you have cacao or cocoa liquor. This can be then pressed under vast hydraulic presses to obtain cocoa butter the dry mass left over is so-called cocoa cake. 
Uh, we have some cocoa butter here, I think, yeah. somewhere. Yeah. So this is what cocoa butter looks like. Uh, does it taste nice? It's it's um, a little bit it's a little bit soapy. It's a bit like so, uh, cream, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's used for cosmetics, isn't the it? The cosmetic industry. Um, it's a it's a good it's a good a very good point. Um, a quick definition of good chocolate is it com contains just cocoa butter. The big chocolate manufacturers, who, who shall I, uh, of course remain nameless, they like to sell their um, cocoa butter to the cosmetic industry because they get a better price for it than they would from chocolate consumers. So they would, instead of using just cocoa butter, they would use part cocoa butter and part various fats. So it's always um, a good idea just to have a look on the packet if it's pure cocoa butter you would have a very good chocolate by that definition alone. Okay, so we're going to bring the next chocolate in while we're continuing to talk, just because there's a logistical issue of getting 320 people fed in sequence. But please hold on. As yeah. Clive says, please hold on to the chocolate. We'll let you know when you can taste it. So I think whilst, whilst this is happening, Andrea, being a chemist, is going to tell us a little bit about fats and why they're so important to chocolate. So, Andrea. Well... Uh, several years ago, there was a famous book which was called Fat is a Feminist Issue. And I've never read it, but the title to me bugs me because it's actually a deeply, profoundly chemical issue. And the question is, you know, what is a fat when we're talking about a vegetable or, 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 or an animal or whatever? What are these fats? And one of the interesting things is that if you actually look at the fats that we have around us, we know that, um, for example, you have margarine, and it melts at a certain temperature. You have cocoa butter that melts very nicely in your mouth. Butter's a little bit slower um, to melt. Lard, kind of unpleasant, because it really doesn't melt very easily, and it doesn't wet the mouth in quite the same way. And then, of course, you have all the vegetable oils and the differences between you know, the sort of sesame seed and the sunflower and the olive and so on. And, and what are these? And so what I thought I'd do was just for, for two minutes, just tell you a little bit about what these fats are. And many of them are actually what we call triglycerides. And they consist of a crucial little molecule in the center. And it's a three carbon chain, which chemists, I suppose, pompous chemists would call um, sorry, would call propane triol, you can see that it consists of three carbons here, and then there are little red balls sticking off. That isn't actually working, I don't think. Anyway, maybe you can see it. Um, three balls with three hydroxyl groups, three OHs on each one. And what OH means in a biological system in many ways is a vulnerability. It's something that you can play with. It's something that you can attach things to. And attached to it is then a long, oily, petrol-like chain. And you can see here, in fact, this is so long that I actually ran out of bits, which is rather bad planning. Um, but you can see that what we have here are 18 carbons in a row. And in general, what you find is that these sort of higher melting um, uh, fats tend to be 16 or 18. And cocoa butter consists primarily of 16 and 18 carbon chains. And these link up onto our glycerol. And you form what chemists call an ester bond up at the top. <laughs> exactly, until some enzyme comes on. Yeah. Now, in fact, that is an unusual process that happens. That's a radical reaction, <laughs> usually driven by intense ultraviolet radiation. Um, in this case, strangely modified by gravity, uh, mediated by gravity. But <clears throat> what you would have is essentially three of these chains, one dangling off each one of those oxygens. And so you can imagine now that you have essentially something in which those nice water-loving OH bits have been replaced by these long petrol-like chains. And so this is the reason why oil and water don't mix, why petrol cocoa butter and so on, is all in these, is that these find it very difficult to be surrounded by water, and so they separate out. Now, what determines the actual melting point? Well, I'll tell you, it's fiendishly complicated. 
but there are kind of two rules to consider. And the first is, how long are the chains? And the second thing is, how snaky they are. Now, most of these, I mean, the chain I've got here is what's called the saturated chain. You'll notice that it's absolutely studded with hydrogens all the way along. However, most plants produce unsaturated fats, and those are ones in which, essentially, you remove two of the hydrogens, and that gives you a kink in the middle. In fact, it's a kink like this, looking like a C. Technical term we use is cis. Easy to remember, it's C-shaped. And what that means is that actually, whereas before these long sort of zigzag chains can kind of snuggle up to each other a bit like spoons in your, in your drawer, once you start introducing that unsaturation, then they don't pack together as well. And that immediately lowers your melting point. And so that really, a sign of a good unsaturated fat, oil, What's the difference between a fat and an oil? All it is the melting point. The oils are the runny ones. The fats are the ones that are solid. And it really comes down to these double bonds. So we have some lard. We have some margarine somewhere that I've lost. There it is. And the margarine is made from vegetable oil. But wait a second. Didn't I just tell you that it should be runny? Well, what they do is they put the hydrogen back on. They hydrogenate the vegetable oil. And what that does is it lets the chains go all nice and zigzag, packed together better. And then we can argue about how the hydrogenation happens and the cis and the trans, but we'll leave that aside. Anyway, those are the issues to think about. Chain length, and is it zigzag or is it kinked? So fat, fat, and more fat. So we've arrived at cocoa butter, Keith. So back to the process then. So we've got um, now your cocoa liquor. This is then mixed and refined. You have to reduce the particle size. Sugar and milk powder is also added for milk chocolate, and it's refined down to between 18 and 22 microns. If it goes below 16 microns, the chocolate it will be like eating wax, It'll be too waxy. Um, above 25, 26 microns, and you would have that gritty taste in your mouth, which you sometimes get with uh, uh, cheap or, or uh, rough chocolate. American so, chocolate? No, no, I don't. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know um, if, um, if I have to reach for my lawyer when I hear you that. Don't no, no. Okay. Um, it is uh, next. It's conched. Um, Mark will talk about conching a little bit later, but this helps develop the texture, the flavours. It reduces the moisture content and drives off the volatiles. Now, conching uh, generally for top quality chocolate takes between six and seventy-two hours. Um, a curiosity is that the Japanese, being very similar to us, similar to the British in, in respect of their uh, love of tradition, the first Swiss chocolate that uh, uh, went into Japan at the end of the 60s was conched for 72 hours. And to this day, the Japanese uh, insist that all Swiss chocolate exported to Japan is conched for 72 hours. Lastly, tempered. And you will hear that a lot. Now, tempering is a heating, cooling, and reheating process. This, you need to do this to pre-crystallize the cocoa butter in the chocolate. Cocoa butter, is an as you've heard, is an extremely complicated polymorphic fat. And what does polymorphic mean for those who are non-scientists, of which I definitely belong to? It means that it's, it's uh, set in a stable or an unstable state. And chocolate needs to be tempered so that on setting, it has a, a nice shine or gloss and a good snap or a break. So in layman's terms, if you're doing it at home, you'd heat the chocolate, uh, dark chocolate, uh, 50 degrees centigrade, milk and white, 40 to 45. You'd cool it down to between 26, 27 degrees, and you'd heat it up to a working temperature of between 30 and 33 degrees centigrade. OK, so the next chocolate that you've got there is called French Dark. And Mark, I think you're going to yeah. tell us a bit about French Dark. Yeah, so, uh, have, have you put it in your mouth yet? Have you have permission? No. It. <laughs> wait you for have to it. wait. Don't even think Because there are some ladies over here, I'm sure, put <laughs> chocolate in their mouth. You have. You've eaten it. <laughs> so there's two to go immediately. You've eaten... Can we get the lights of the lady? 
Um, okay, so look, I know you can't hang off much longer, so we're not going to do too much talking, but I, what I want you to do is, is realize a thing we haven't mentioned yet. Um, chocolate is the most wonderful substance because it's, it's designed purely for your pleasure, and the only thing, its only trick is that when you put it in your mouth, it goes in a solid and it will melt in your mouth. So it melts. And it's designed to melt in your mouth. And all the stuff we're going to talk about now, it's all about getting it to actually melt in your mouth at exactly the right temperature. And it's a huge technical achievement to do that. And so anyone who bites it and quickly swallows it is missing the whole game. Partly because it's very pleasurable to have a liquid that's hot and syrupy in your mouth, but also because the taste, a lot of your taste, is in your nose. And so you need the vapor from the chocolate to be produced, which happens once it melts. I mean, you can smell chocolate, it's quite a nice smell, even solid, but when it's liquid, it's really smelly, and I've been, been melting your chocolate that you've got in front of you here, so this is gonna happen in your mouth, it's gonna, it's gonna be like this, in your mouth. And then, it becomes unbelievably aromatic. And that's the, that is the whole thing, all, you know, Keith and hundreds of thousands of people around the world just want you to enjoy that moment where it melts in your mouth, you get this volatile, which we'll talk about later, all the chemicals that are, are going to come into your nose, they're going to go into your blood, they're going to do things to your body. The syrup is going to gush down the back of your throat. And there's one other thing I want you to look out for. <laughs> for this sensation, <laughs> Prolong the pleasure. Actually, actually, maybe this is a good moment to do it, because now I can talk you through it. So everybody, if you don't mind, you're going to have a mass eating of chocolate, but no chewing. All right? So in the mouth, Onto the tongue and wait. And as a 70% chocolate, it is, any, any jaw motion is a dead giveaway, yeah. by the way. Um, it's a 70% chocolate, so it's, quite, it's got a high melting point. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So you actually have to be a bit patient. And in a way, this is going to be the, this is, this is, this is the art of chocolate. It's how you, you get something that's a high melting point, but not too high, because all the very flavorsome things can happen at a high melting point. Now you should feel it melting in your mouth. It's starting to get a bit softer and melting. And, and you're getting a bit of uh, liquid. Uh, we'll go through it in a minute. And maybe something's starting to drip down. You'll, you'll get a very great sensation through your nose. This is a really critical thing. Is that it, what, when something melts, it's a bit of an odd thing, but it absorbs heat. And um, so, so it's absorbing heat to melt. And this, this it does it in two ways. One is just to melt it, which causes, is, requires energy. And it's called latent heat. And that latent heat is the, same, it's the same effect as when you put um, water into one of those coolers for wine, you know? And the, as the water evaporates, or the same effect on, as sweat on your, on, when you're sweating, you feel it cooling, it's because there's a latent heat from going from one state to the other. So in the case of sweat, it's liquid to gas. But in the case in your mouth now, it's going from solid to liquid, and you're getting a cooling in your mouth. You'll get a really pleasant cooling sensation, especially if it's been properly tempered. So here, here's a question then. Did anybody enjoy that? Mmm. They can't string sentences together anymore. That's good. Mmm, it's good. All right, so um, off so, you go. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to... Yeah, first of all, that's, that's a nice... So, Keith, back, back to you. Okay, this was... Um, Mark had just given you there to try a, uh, a French or a French style, dark chocolate, 70% cocoa solids. Um, there is the misconception, or it's gone into a sort of urban myth that High cocoa content in chocolate is a guarantee of quality. Um, the percentages alone tell us nothing about the quality of the chocolate. Um, all wine is 100% grape juice, but some is very poor indeed. What is important is what bean is used, its correct fermentation, where it's grown, and certainly not least, the skill of the end user or chocolatier. Um, that was 70%. That's, um, how, how did you find that? Did you find that too strong or...? That's right, good. Most people... There's uh, two kilograms of it. <laughs> three, three, we've got three. <laughs> Most uh, people's taste uh, for dark chocolate will vary between 50 and 70, 72%, something like that. Anything over 75% is too astringent to enjoy. So an average 70% uh, dark chocolate will contain 44% uh, cocoa butter, 26% cocoa liquor, and 30% sugar. Um, just to go back to what Mark was saying about the enjoyment, the sensual enjoyment of chocolate, um, we, we all smell things. When we go into, say, a bakery, suddenly memories flood back. 
Um, we have a memory of tastes and flavours. So, and chocolate appeals to all the senses. Um, just the, looking at it, the light, the intensity, its sound, when you break it, the sound and vibration, its touch, the temperature, consistency, at the taste, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, or umami. Is there another one? Well, I'm not sure. There are. There is. There are there is. That's there is. Talk, yes. But there are a lot of chemicals in, in chocolate other than fat. And so, for example, serotonin, which is actually a substance that is a transmitter in your brain, is found in chocolate. Phenylethylamine is another substance that is, is found in chocolate. And there are also a number of stimulants in chocolate, like theobromine, for example, which is an extremely um, active substance as well. And there is also a very interesting substance called anandamide, which I think um, Andrea will get up on the, on the screen now. But this top substance, which is anandamide, has recently been found to actually act on the same receptors in the body that parts of the marijuana plant will act on. <laughs> and this may account for some of the um, mood-enhancing activity of chocolate. And very recently, there is a study from the University of San Diego in the United States that said the more depressed you are, the more chocolate you eat. And we tend to eat more chocolate in the Northern Hemisphere. Whether that's because we don't see enough light, who knows? But it's, it's a very clear study. The more chocolate you eat, the more depressed you are, or the more depressed you are, the more chocolate you eat. So there's no question it's got mood-enhancing um, capacity. And there are a number of these chemicals found in the chocolate beyond the fat that probably make it a, an over, overall a good sensation to have the chocolate. So we're now going to move on, I think, to the one that you've got in front of you, which is called Tonka Bean, um, which is not a toy. Again, please, uh, can you wait? I'll give you another. Um, <laughs> something else, something a little bit uh, interesting. Too late. Uh, oh, well. Who's eaten it already? OK, you, you will hear, before we carry on this, you will hear about uh, Italian chocolate, French chocolate. People say, I like Swiss chocolate. I like French chocolate, whatever. There are no cocoa, as I've said before, there's no cocoa plantations in the Loire Valley. Okay, the cocoa is processed into chocolate in these countries, and there are quite pronounced national tastes. So the Latin countries prefer dark chocolate. Northern Europe, of which we obviously belong, milk chocolate is more popular. So, um, the but, the, but the milk, surely, Keith, from somewhere like Switzerland, because it is a, yes. an advertising gimmick that they use is yes. their cows produce Indeed. and they do produce richer milk if you've been and eaten their yogurts and their milk does that have an influence on the on the chocolate it it does and the swiss are very proud of their milk and cream but um their big secret particularly with milk chocolate uh don't swallow the, all the advertising when you see heidi going up the mountain it's it's that's not quite right what the swiss do is they caramelize or steam bake the milk powder at a high temperature and that gives it a very caramel, caramel, rich, unctuous caramel taste, rather like dulce de leche, or for those who are familiar with that product. Um, the three great chocolate nations are Belgium, Switzerland, and France. Well done, sir. Okay, the Swiss, serious eaters of chocolate, and they invented milk chocolate in 1876. The French, bring the same principles of origin and grand cru to chocolate as they do to wine. Now the Belgians, very interesting indeed. You think that's a population of 11 million people, okay, that's the, that's the population of Greater London. And Belgium is about the size of Wales. So we have a population, Greater London, in an area the size of Wales, that's 2,232 chocolate shops. That's more chocolate shops in Belgium than there are Tesco's in the whole of the United Kingdom. <laughs> so, remember that fact, it may help you later on. Um, they are serious uh, chocolate lovers. Anyway, you've got your chocolate now, you've got your, your Tonka chocolate. So, Mark, ma are you allowed, allowed to eat it, Mark? You're, um, I wanted to, I mean, you can, do you want to talk about the what makes, what is the Tonka, what, so what's in it? For okay. A or do you want people to put it in their mouth while you no, cook they the can, food? No, they can, just before you put it in your mouth, I'll... I'll, I'll <laughs> it's too late. Too late. I'll, a whole row I'll of tell you here. another way to find the flavours. People, you'll say, it's just like wine experts. Oh, I can taste grapefruit, I can taste blueberry, I can taste blackcurrant, etc., etc. 
Okay, to find the flavors when tasting chocolate, you put the, you hold your nose, you put the chocolate in your mouth, you chew. If the person next to you is going blue, just give them a, with a, you chew, and then you breathe in through the nose. Okay, that is how you can find the flavors in chocolate. But now we'll come on to Tonka. I don't want to rush to be uh, uh, too far behind. This chocolate is made, or I sourced this chocolate. I worked for many years in Switzerland. I have a good relationship with this company. Uh, they are a niche manufacturer. The, the company's name is Felchlin, and they specialize in producing premier Grand Cru chocolate. Felklin is a very small manufacturer. They have one small factory in Schwitz in central Switzerland. And now this milk chocolate has got 38% cocoa solids with a mark of origin, Sudalago in Venezuela. It's delicately roasted cocoa. It's got caramel, honey, and vanilla notes, all blended with a full-bodied, creamy, milky taste of Swiss milk chocolate. Keith, you've got them going to such a point. Now, this man, <laughs> this yeah. man is so desperate to put the chocolate in his please, mouth. Please, please try we now. Must please let you, but remember, you have to hold your yeah. nose, okay. put it in. So here it's combined with tonka. Tonka is a seed grown in the tropics. It is used in a spice, mainly in German specialities, such as Stollen or Baumkuchen, Bam. and has a pungent vanilla, hay, and bitter almond aroma. The tonka beans here, they are grated, they are infused in the cocoa butter, and then this is blended with a chocolate. Did you like that? Mm. There's not a lot of conversation this evening, really. It's in... mm. So was that different to the last one? Yes. yes. Okay. I just, want to, I want to just show you something while you're eating that chocolate. Um, so um, one of the things we've just been talking about is the, is the quality of the cocoa butter, and that's got a very high quality cocoa butter in it, even... Um, and here, here is some I melted earlier. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. Anyway, um, okay, and I wanted to give you a feel for how much energy, how much calories <laughs> is in that. And I'm going to make a candle out of it. So I'm just going to pour, pour that fat into this little dish, which I've taken the petroleum wax out of it. And I'm, I'm going to put the cocoa butter, which you're now eating, right? So you're, you're eating fat almost exactly the same as this. I mean, exactly the same as this. Um, and there it is. And... Um, if you're wondering where, how good that candle will be, ooh, have you got the matches yet? Yeah. There you are. There you go. A perfectly nice candle. Now, this is a very useful thing to know if you're ever in a blackout. <laughs> because people always say, for emergencies, stock chocolate. And we'll get back to this later, <laughs> because obviously it's an important thing for many reasons. But one of the reasons is, you can get heat and light from chocolate. It is a perfect food in so many ways. Um, so the next chocolate then that you've got coming out is Colombian chocolate. I don't know whether, Keith, you want to say a few words yes. about Colombian chocolate, but again, please, please don't eat it just yet until you've heard a little bit more about it. Okay, Pro probably the most interesting cocoa growing area in Colombia is in the Magdalena Valley. It is sandwiched between two spurs of the Andes in the department of Santander. To the east is Sudalago. This is the home of, uh, of uh, the Porcelana and many of the other great Venezuelan varieties of cocoa. The genetics of the cocoa in Santander are closely related to Venezuelan Criollo, so this makes this an exceptional bean source of fine, fine chocolate. Santander's manufacturing plant is in Rio Negro, and they have a uh, development farm in Tamesis. This is one of the highest farms of its type in the world. Here you can see baby coconut, mango, passion fruit, lime, carambola, star fruit growing among the cocoa. Um, I like the English analogy, what grows together goes together. I find that these, these fruits, they work so much better with, uh, with chocolate than um, the pickled onion, the fish and the garlic. <laughs> I leave that to the great masters. Okay, so what else is Colombia famous for? Uh, sensible answers, please. <laughs> of course, it's coffee. A curiosity <laughs> is that in certain, certain parts of Colombia, both coffee and grow, cocoa grow together. Now, this is somewhat unusual, with cocoa needing constant warmth, rainfall, and shade. 
and coffee, cooler temperatures and, and a low rainfall. Um, if you taste this chocolate, which is grown among the, the coffee plants, I'm sure that you'll be able to notice the, the coffee notes immediately in the chocolate. And this is a 70%, again, a 70% uh, cocoa solids. Okay, so you've now got permission you can eat this one. We'll have a... Tell us what you think of this. Now, while while uh, you're well, eating you're, it, yeah. you've heard a lot yeah. from my friends here about um, the fats that may not necessarily do you any good. But here's a very interesting piece of paper I found recently. People who eat chocolate appear to live almost a year longer on average than those who don't. Now, that would suggest to me it's worth actually continuing to eat them, if nothing else, isn't yeah. it? So over to you, Mark. What well, have you got I, to I, tell us? I wanted to show you something about this one you're eating now. It looks a bit like this. When it's in your mouth, it's going to have a viscosity that looks like this. And it's a very pure, wonderful liquor, which has a, has a very um, high viscosity, so it will really wash around your mouth. That's a very different effect from, from that milk chocolate you tried, the Tonka, which looks like this. It's actually very hard to get a milk chocolate to melt in the same way because it's got a high sugar content and a high milk content. And actually, if you just continue heating this, it's quite hard to get it to melt at all. It sort of just, it, it becomes soft like this and gooey, but it doesn't, it doesn't have a kind of feeling of kind of this washing around your mouth becoming a kind of liquor. And that's a very interesting difference between um, the milk chocolates and the dark chocolates. So let, let's have a straw poll then of the, um, the four that you've had so far, including the nibs. No, you had the nibs. I know you ate yours ahead of time, but... <laughs> So we've had four, including the nibs. So who, who's, who liked the nibs the best? French dark? The Tonka bean? Ah, oh, you good. The Colombian? It's not bad. It's not bad. So per kilogram, which is the most expensive? Um, pro probably the, um, the Tonka bean, because it's made with a Venezuelan. Criollo. The um, Colombian chocolate, uh, it's, they've just discovered the UK as a market, so um, it's a very, very good quality, uh, quality chocolate. But just looking at the people that preferred the milk chocolate, that's still, dark chocolate is becoming more and more popular in the UK, but there is still a lot of lovers of milk chocolate. And that's not bad either. I love milk chocolate. Mark. Yeah, well, one of the things you'll notice too is the fineness of the quality of the of the powder that, that remains. And that's to do with this, with this grinding up. There's a grinding up stage from the nibs. And basically what they do is this, they just kind of, you've had the nibs, and, and, and what they're doing is they're grinding up like this. And um, Keith mentioned these micron sizes of powder and how you had to, now one thing you've got to remember is that it was, it's actually become very difficult to do this. I mean, it used to be very difficult to do this. And if you look at old, um, pictures of, of chocolate manufacturers, they have these enormous stones and these big um, stone wheels which they run across. And what they're doing is, is breaking it down into powder. I'm going to show you under the microscope what it looks like because that affects the flavour and the texture in the mouth quite a lot. And when I say flavour, I mean texture affects flavour, it's because it's well known that there is a kind of cross-modal experience of taste. And so gritty things taste, actually taste different than smooth things. Um, now, hold on a minute. Where's the other bit of the microscope? Oh, there it is. Okay, got it. Um, so here we go. So uh, now we're just putting a microscope on. You'll see what I've done by, by, by grinding it up. This is what chocolate is. It's ground up powders of the cocoa nibs. Now, what they've done is they've taken out the fat we just talked about, and they add it back later. And the idea is to get this solid, which you just put in your mouth, to be these tiny particles to be coated all the way around with, with a little bit of sugar and fat so that it's like a matrix of fat with these little particles in it. And if these particles are too big, you'll notice a very gritty taste in your mouth. And if they're too small, it becomes slightly waxy because essentially it feels like you're eating a, a, a fat, like a pure fat, like a candle. <laughs> That's the link. Anyway. So, um, so can one of the three of you then answer a simple question? What about white chocolate? How do we get oh, white chocolate? We can answer that question. There's well, no, I mean, you come would. on. That's why we've got you all wrong. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so white, white chocolate is essentially the cocoa butter 
has been taken out of this process, pressed out of the process, because a lot of the early drinks, which is what, how chocolate started, were, were unpleasant for two reasons. One, they were very bitter. Well, I mean, depends on your taste, but they were, they were said to be unpleasant for two reasons. One is that they were bitter, and the other is they were very fatty. So it's like drinking a fatty soup. Um, and so if you take this cocoa butter out, which is this stuff here, then, and then you add it just a little bit back, you get these various grades of chocolate which we're eating now. But what if you take this fat alone and make that into some confectionery, add sugar to it, add milk to this, what do you get? Well, you get white chocolate. The Milky Bar Kid. The Milky Bar Kid. And actually, Keith was telling me before that, that I didn't realise this, that, that when you do this in, the, in a real process, it still smells of chocolate. So you have a fat which you could use as a sun cream or in any other makeup, which would smell of chocolate. And, but apparently this is not popular. So they, <laughs> they spend a lot of time getting those, those molecules out so it doesn't taste, so your makeup doesn't taste of cocoa chocolate. Um, and so, um, but, now, but now maybe, so, that, so white chocolate doesn't taste of chocolate, as it were. But, but um, Keith was telling me about a chocolate that, you're, that he's been making. Yes, there's um, uh, no advertising, but, um, uh, <laughs> but um, just as Mark says, there's... Um, it's called deodorization. So the, the flavor deodorization is a chemical process which strips out the, the smell, but also strips out some of the flavor. So you will be able to buy uh, a white chocolate which actually tastes, you can taste the cocoa in a white chocolate, which is somewhat unusual. And the other thing I want to, want to say about chocolate at this point is that it's extremely dry. You sort of think of it as kind of I don't know, implicitly as something that's wet because it melts, but it's very, very dry. And conching has a process of getting these uh, grounds and chocolate uh, and rolling it for 72 hours gets rid of a lot of moisture, and that's part of the reason for doing it. And I want to show you that because I want to sort of prove it to you. So here is, here is some molten chocolate. Can you hold that, actually, Andrea? Sorry about that. Here's some molten chocolate, right? And it's got a very nice viscosity to it, so I'll, I'll just stir it round. You can see that's quite, you know, quite a nice... It's not a very good camera, but you, know, you can get a hang of that. Now, if I add a tiny amount of water, so this is very dry. It's very, very dry. Now, if I add a tiny amount of water, a weird thing is going to happen. It's not going to get more runny, as you might expect somehow. All the water is going to stick to the sugar, and it's going to gum the whole thing up. So a little bit of water goes in, and, and instead of it becoming runnier, it's going to gum up, although... That didn't seem to work. Oh, there it goes. It's gumming. It's it's gumming. gumming. God, I was a bit worried then. Anyway, it's worked. And of course it's worked. Science, isn't it? That's what we're doing. Uh, no, don't do that. Then gumming. I'm gumming. This is something you can do at home, because he's actually using just a gumming. straightforward poacher. Is that right? It's a... But look to how, do look, this experiment. Yes. But look at that. Look at that stuff yes. now. With a tiny bit of water, we've turned it into something completely different. And that's, be that's, that's because... The water's at, is kind of hung on to the sugars, and it's now sticking everything together. All those little particles have all been stuck together, and we've got a, a semi-solid now instead of this beautiful liquid. So that's why getting rid of the water is really important, because that's what you'd have in your mouth otherwise. You wouldn't have that beautiful feeling of a, kind of, of, a, of a liquid pouring down the back of your throat. I keep returning to that, don't I? but that's how I feel it goes. There was, anyway. Has anybody in the room got any idea, then, of why I put up this... Uh, recent announcement that people who eat chocolate appear to live almost a year longer on average than those who don't. What, what do you think about chocolate maybe is able to prolong life? Well, the serotonin is probably the thing that gives you some stimulation, but somebody said flavonoids, and there are lots of... You can, you can, but that's not one of the questions, unfortunately. Um, there are a lot of antioxidants, and in fact, there is, is twice the level of antioxidants in chocolate, particularly dark chocolate, than you have in prunes. So although you're encouraged to eat lots of fruit, dark chocolate has more antioxidants, and antioxidants increasingly are being thought to be useful in preventing against cancer, against cardiovascular damage. So there are all sorts of interesting things in, these, um, in this chocolate beyond the fats that these two have been encouraging you to um, understand. And I have no idea now what Andrea is going to do. OK, we've got this demo, which is a bit gratuitous. But anyway, it's worth seeing. And um, if you is know anything... where we need to stand well clear? A little bit back, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we've got another chocolate taste, haven't we? So we'll, we'll, don't worry, we'll taste that in a minute. OK, go on. No, we're keeping them. Are we? Are we keeping them? Okay. No, they can wait for a little while. All right. I just want to cool this water well, down. All I you. really wanted to do is to just raise this issue of 
really the dryness of chocolate, and particularly cocoa powder, plus, as we've said before, the kind of energy content. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try, we'll see if this works, to flare off a bit of cocoa powder. If it doesn't, well, uh, I'll do it tomorrow or something. I'm just, I'm just distracted. No, that it didn't work. Uh, it will come back in a couple of minutes. Um, I'm going to reload it, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to it. It's going to be better than that. Um, um, whilst, whilst I'm doing that, then, we will will allow you to eat the next chocolate. You're going to have to wait for the last one for a little while, but what you now have is Madagascan dark. Don't put it in your mouth just yet. <laughs> Are you going to say a few yeah. words, Keith, about okay. it? So put it back on that tissue. <laughs> this, look, look, this lady is eating hers already. We have security, please. Is it good? Is it good? <laughs> um... Firstly, to come to Mark's um, little experiment there. Um, those of you um, that watch the TV, uh, you can see in future that the so-called the celebrity chefs or whatever, they will avoid chocolate like the plague because A, it's very difficult to work with, and B, because they're chefs, they work in kitchens with a lot of water vapor, a lot of moisture, a lot of damp in the atmosphere. So chocolate then is extremely difficult to work with. So. I have never seen one all the years I've been watching the TV in this country, and I doubt that it will ever happen, that um, they might make a chocolate cake, but they will not attempt to make chocolates or a chocolate bar. Anyway, you can please try the Madagascan chocolate now. This is 64% uh, cocoa solids. This is a chocolate that I generally give to people who say, I don't like, I, don't, I only eat milk chocolate, I don't like dark chocolate. This is a very uh, consumer friendly, it's not too bitter. The cocoa beans here are mainly uh, Trinitario with a mixture of Criollo. And most of the crop in Madagascar is surprising. There's only two large plantations in Madagascar. Um, the plantations are to the north of the capital, which is uh, Antan Anarivo. And there are, it only produces four to 5,000 metric tons of cocoa a year, so Madagascan chocolate is, is quite rare. And here, with this chocolate, you have a typical example of a Madagascan chocolate and its specific taste profile. It's a well, very reddish colored chocolate. No, please. The berry and the citrus notes dominate. I think you can taste the citrus, the fruitiness, and a creamy finish. So that is really for people that say, I don't like, my, don't like dark chocolate, that's an ideal chocolate to try for people who only like milk chocolate and want to try something different. How much is that kilo? So did you enjoy that? How much is that kilo? Um, it all depends how much you're buying. A kilo? <laughs> a ton? A kilo. How much per kilo? A kilo. Um, well, then you'd have to... Wholesale. Wholesale, I presume about um, 10 to 12 pounds. Now, have we got people in the room with the microphones? Because I think whilst Einstein and his friends here are getting ready, <laughs> are, are there any questions beyond the price of chocolate? Please, can, can you just wait for the microphone, please, and we'll take a few questions. Which one? Which yeah. one? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, the question is, you showed um, the granulation of the chocolate when you added some water to it. It turned into what looked on the screen to me like little granules in suspension. Why doesn't that happen with the saliva in our mouths? Good question. Andrea. Oh, you've done it. <laughs> You're Einstein. This man deserves a prize. <laughs> well, I think, Don't know. I think, I think unquestionably it does is that one of the things that happens in the mouth is the separation between the sugars and the fats. But actually, there's an awful lot of saliva there, and you're producing more as you go along. And you're really talking about a kind of multi-phase system that happens in your mouth. The cocoa butter melts. You have the water and the sugar that are sort of dissolved out. And that's the joy of it. So yes, it happens. The other thing that was happening here, of course, was that the temperature starts to drop when you add the water. And so that will also contribute to that, to that thickening process. Um, but there, of course, you've got really kind of a lot of stuff, you're, and you're, you're, you're watching what happens. It won't last that long in your mouth, because most of us, frankly, <laughs> it goes. Any other questions? Please, there's a lady over here. 
You said that more aromas are released when the chocolate's melted. Why is that? So, um, you're, you're putting the chocolate in your mouth when it's, um, it'll be room temperature, so it'll be about 20 degrees or so. Your mouth, inside your mouth, is, is 37 degrees usually. Hold on a minute, let me just see what my mouth is. That, that's... I want to see the inside of your mouth. No, no, no that's no, just no, a no, thermometer. No, we're going to use a thermometer. So, if, so, so that's room temperature, 21 degrees at the moment up here. So that's what the chocolate's going into your mouth at. You put it goes into your mouth. So it raises the temperature. <laughs> you can talk about this. Uh, yeah, so, so look, so. it keeps going up and up. Um, when it hits the melting point of the chocolate, it starts to melt. And so you're raising the temperature of anything. You raise the temperature of anything. Like in the summer, things just smell more aromatic because lots of stuff is coming off. It's, get, it's getting above their, 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 um, their, their boiling point, if you like. You get a lot of volatiles that come off, and that's what you smell. So smell, smell is a direct chemical trans, uh, communication between whatever it is in your mouth or outside to your nose. So that's really what's happening. OK, any other? Because a lady here. Yeah, I'll get to you. Thank you. Um, when you added the water um, and it went gooey. I'm sure anybody that's tried cooking with chocolate at home will be familiar with, with doing that. Um, is there any way of redeeming it, bringing it back again? Um, yeah, no. Uh, there is, isn't there? Yes, yeah. you, you can. There's various ways, depends on what you're use, using it for. If you're using it for a cake, confectionery, you could add a, a neutral oil, such as sunflower or peanut oil. You could also, um, if you want to use it to uh, make chocolates, you can add more cocoa butter. Um, liquid cocoa butter, and that will bring it back to the original consistency. It will have a more waxy mouthfeel because uh, you are increasing the percentage of um, cocoa butter to uh, cocoa liquor, but you will have the same fluidity. Okay. There's a question question down here. You just just this this lady here. Get that. You mentioned um, flavonoids and serotonin, but is there actual Proof that chocolate's good for you. Well, I showed you the piece of paper. It says, <laughs> what more do you need? This, people who eat chocolate appear to live almost a year longer on average than those who don't. Now, the, the one about depression was a serious study that came out very recently that the more depressed you are, the more chocolate you eat. So I think in terms of the chemicals in chocolate that we know either are transmitters in your brain or can potentiate the actions of transmitters like dopamine I think is real. Whether or not chocolate really protects against cancer and all the other claims that are made, I think very, very difficult trials that need doing. But there's no doubt, the, as I said to you earlier, the antioxidant content of known antioxidants is twice that of prunes. So it is quite high. It's getting up there close to broccoli and some of the other things that we're encouraged to eat that perhaps aren't quite as pleasant as this. Now, there's a man who's been very patient over here. Apropos the last question, when you were showing us your molecular caterpillar, you mentioned triglycerides. And I immediately thought, uh-oh, cholesterol. And then you made it worse by saying fat. <laughs> and carry on and on. And I think, thought to myself, here am I eating pure cholesterol. That's why I showed you the lard. <laughs> so would you like to comment on that? Um, yes. I mean, cholesterol is something which um, is, is often associated with triglycerides, with these, these I mean, I've only got a, a monoglyceride here, but you know, there should be two more. But cholesterol is actually a completely different family of compounds. It's actually a series of, of four rings kind of linked together with then sort of studied, studded with little dangly bits. And it turns out that cholesterol is able to uh, dissolve in these types of molecules. These types of molecules are very similar to the ones that form membranes in cells. In those cases, there are two dangly arms and then a phosphate group on the, on the top. The cholesterol dissolves in there, and what it does is it serves to change the viscosity and the mobility of the membrane itself. Now, when it comes to cocoa, there's no cholesterol there. It's just when you've got cocoa butter, all you have is the fat. And the cholesterol is quite a separate issue. Now, if you decide that you're going to have a bacon butty every morning, then you will get all kinds of glycerides and loads of cholesterol. 
But perhaps I should just say something. <laughs> the lights are so bright here, it's terrifying. Um, I should just say one thing. I'm always worried. I always get nervous when we start saying, well, you know, we should start eating more chocolate or more chili or more broccoli because somehow they contain some mysterious omega something uh, entity. I mean, look at this stuff on the front. How many, who here can tell me what omega 3 or omega 6 actually means? Is there anybody here? Is there a chemist? No, nobody knows. I mean, there's the odd chemist who knows. I looked it up the other day because I thought maybe someone would ask. But what we're talking about here is a marketing gag. Is we're talking about a kind of pseudo pharmaceuticalization to try and get us to eat even more of this stuff for some stupid reason. The reason I'm going to eat Madagascan. Because it tastes good. <laughs> well, I, I, I also, Andre, I have to tell you that the man that asked the question is obviously not that concerned about it because he's just very rapidly taken the last chocolate. <laughs> and I assume, sir, you're going to eat it. Now, this very last chocolate. To show them just one thing about um, one of the amazing things about fats. The, the other thing that we haven't really mentioned yet, well, we, we, well Keith did mention it about tempering, which is that the, we, you sort of assume that fats are these kind of these yeah wiggly molecules and they're kind of doing all this stuff and it kind of s sort of soft stuff. But the fats you're eating are crystals. They're crystals of fat and they're very very particular crystals of fat. And that's weird to think that chocolate is a crystal, isn't it? it well, it's a crystalline material. It's a, it's a weird, odd feeling. And that's why the melting point in your mouth is very distinct. As you know, sort of crystals melt at a melting point, and they really just go. And so that's, what, that's the art of the chocolatier, is, is to make that happen. And I want to just reinforce that by what do crystals look like when they're, when they're solidifying. And I've got some sodium acetate here, which you will know if, you've ever, if you're a keen walker, but suffer from, uh, for, from having a bit Red cold nose. hands. Mm. What? Red noses? What? So anyway, uh, so this, is, this has got high latent heat, and so it's in hand warmers. But it will crystallize on demand, hopefully. Will it? Anyway, this did work in the lab the other day, and uh, we're really going to hope so. If I, if, I, if I put a crystal in, which is what tempering is, is about to do, um, then I can hopefully... Oh, do you see that? Wash. Go, go. So, so you can get it to crystallize immediately, and what... That's what tempering is doing, right? You've got to get it to a point where it's doing that inside the chocolate. And that's a really, really skillful thing to be able to do. What, what, Andrew, what? See, I told you you was Einstein, didn't I? <laughs> if I can just, just add to this, the, really, the, the reason why I think most chemists are absolutely terrified of molecules like this is because something like sodium acetate, you've just seen, you can seed it, and off it goes, it starts to crystallize, and the, and the crystals grow. The problem with these triglycerides is very interesting. First of all, you'll notice that that sodium acetate sat there quite happily for about 10 minutes. And it was only when Mark gave a little assistance, in other words, a crystal of sodium acetate. That crystal of sodium acetate, what it did was it taught the other molecules how to crystallize. So they didn't know how to do it. He provided a seed, a starting point for the crystal growth. Now, when it comes to triglycerides, and to cocoa in particular, one of the problems is that these snaky chains, if you think about it, look at this thing. This thing can wiggle all over the place. How are you going to crystallize them? Are you going to crystallize them with all three chains hanging down next to each other? Are you going to put the two on the outside down and the one in the middle up? Left, down, up. I'm sorry, down, down, up. Down, up, down. There are loads of possibilities. And earlier, we heard the word polymorphism. Polymorphism is the phenomenon by which a particular material can crystallize in a series of different forms, which have different stabilities. And what this means is that you could, for example, seed the crystal so that you choose poly polymorph called alpha. And for lack of imagination, chemists have gone in and called the other one beta. And the one after that was gamma. Then they realized there was another one. And they called that one beta primed because it looks a bit like beta. There's, there's a complete morass. There's this incredible crystallization landscape, if you will. 
And what you need to do is to shepherd your fat into the polymorph which has the right melting point. And this is one of the keys to the Chocolatier's art, is actually being able to get this tempering step where what you're doing is you're kind of warming and cooling. It's annealing, effectively. It's the same thing that a glass blower does to kind of get everything to sort of, all the strain in the system to come out. You warm it, you cool it. You warm it, you cool it. And what you're doing is you're working towards a particular polymorph, which is the one that you want. So, Andrew, this is what happens. This is what happens if it goes wrong. So, this is the kind of chocolates that people would have ate at the turn of the century of the last century, because it's there's it's no doubt about it. They didn't understand what was going on, and it, it that's what happens if you just if you just let chocolate cool uncontrollably. You get this thing called flat fat bloom. You can see that there's a few crystals that have got this nice black gloss, which is the, is the five, is, is, is the crystal state five, which is what Keith wants to get and, and does achieve in all the ones you've had so far. And if you're not, and if you, you see fat plume often in shops where it's been a hot day a few days before. And what's happened is, you know, the chocolatiers have, get, have, have managed to get the right crystal state, but then the shop hasn't kept the temperature right. It's gone up, it's changed the crystal state, the, the fat's come out and has recrystallized in a different way, and you get this thing called fat bloom, which, which is, isn't dangerous to eat, and it, it doesn't t taste that bad, but it's very unsightly, and it changes the mechanics and, and the sight of it. Now, before you shepherd the next bit of fat, which is a very nice term, I have to say, um, into your mouth. This last one is, is you'll hear in a minute, is, is one of the best you're going to have, we think. Um, I'm going to allow a few more questions as well if the man with the microphone is around. So I know there was a, a question here in the front. Please. Just, no, this chap here. Yeah. Thanks. I, just, I, I wanted to make a comment actually on the question about saliva, which I think is very interesting. What we saw on the stage was the addition of pure water to the molten chocolate. But saliva is not pure water. It's a very complex fluid containing carbohydrates, proteins, a variety of enzymes. And I suspect that what is happening is that something, some constituent of the saliva is protecting the sugars from adhesion that the water would ordinarily cause. So there may be less of that adhesion going on than you'd expect when you add pure water. That's going to get you closer to one of those two kilo bags. <laughs> yes, it's not, You're I'm, probably right, actually. There's You're a question, question, lady, right at the back, please, who's being very patient. There's also one up at the top. Yeah. I was reading an article the other day about trying to make low fat chocolate, and I was wondering chemically, could you ever have a fine low fat chocolate, or is it just kind of something to eat for people who want chocolate and no fat? And from a chocolatier's perspective, could you ever have a fine, low-fat chocolate? Firstly, uh, why? Why would you want to do that? Um, yeah, yeah. Sec exactly. Secondly, the, as I explained uh, earlier, the, for quality chocolate, it is mainly the bean used, its fermentation, uh, its correct roasting, processing, and the skill of the end user. You could uh, theoretically uh, defat. I mean, there are cocoa powders which are defatted. There is no doubt that you could uh, possibly technically defat some cocoa liquor to make a fine quality chocolate. I just think it's a commercial, probably, or probably a commercial issue, as the demand would be uh, relatively low. Now. Andrea, your rant has to be quite slow because they have some very, oh, very short because oh, they have some extremely good chocolate they want to eat. Yeah. I'm always worried about diet foods. I mean, the idea that you might take something which is so perfect, so exquisite, so technical, so developed as chocolate, and then you might want to go and debase it. Why? Because you want to encourage people in moral hazard. That's what it's about. What you want to do is to give people the illusion that they can live in a certain way and that somehow they will be safe from something else, right? It's like the banks, except in chocolate. <laughs> My feeling is that if we want to worry about people's diets and so on, 
And the first thing we should do is to ban every diet food because every individual should take responsibility for their own chocolate intake. Okay, now, there was another question just on this side as well while the lady with the microphone's there. And then I'll come to you, sir, I promise. Why is chocolate poisonous for dogs, or more poisonous for dogs? That's a good one. I don't know the answer to that. Is that not theobromine? Yeah, it could be theobromine. It's theobromine. I mean, yeah. the xanthines are handled differently. The theobromine, which is related to caffeine, is handled differently by, by different species, and it's maybe the particularly sensitive. I, I'm afraid I don't know. We'll try and find out for you. If you come and see us afterwards, we'll do some homework and, and send you the answer if we can. Please. It's an extraordinary thing, isn't it, that it's poisonous for dogs and they can actually die quite quickly with yes. a small amount of chocolate. Uh, I, I was interested in your talking about the sort of close uh, chemical uh, affinity or relationship or whatever it was to uh, can, can, cannabis, cannabinoids. I've heard of spliff heads. Are there chock heads? I mean, seriously, is it addictive at all, even at a low level? Well, I, I mean, it's been suggested it can be addictive, but one thing is, is absolutely certain. If you do take chocolate regularly, a bit like if you take coffee regularly, go for a week or two weeks without taking any whatsoever and you'll get a thumping headache, you'll get a lot of signs of withdrawal. So there are clearly things in there. I don't think it's the anandamide. The anandamide is the, the, the substance that was up on the screen earlier. Um, but I think there are clearly some other things in there. But if you take your whey, whey chocolate or coffee, you certainly get a throbbing headache. That could be the xanthines. Now, any other quick questions before we give you the chance to have your next one? Please. Right, that addiction thing. Is there not, was there not a study done um, about people's um, love of the, just the feeling of it in their mouth and that it was very close to a kiss or the closest that you could get to a kiss? And people, in a sense, were replacing their perhaps lack of kisses. I think Mark's been reading too many books. <laughs> I thought there was. I thought there I'm was I'm sure a that's right, but I think there's enough chemicals in there that can affect your mood with that. <laughs> I th Please. I, what I'm saying is it may not... You can be addicted to something not because of, of, of essentially some pharmacological effect, although, you know, that of course you can, but also mechanically yes. <laughs> addicted to things. We'll come is... on to that in a second. <laughs> Right, one question here, please. Hello, thanks very much indeed. This is really interesting. Um, very quickly, organic beans. Do you yourself, Keith, could you tell a discernible difference whether the beans were organic or not in the end result of chocolate? Um, hmm, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, there's a lot of politics goes on here, uh, which uh, I'm too... Um, not quite qualified to talk about, though I do have my own take on it. I've been to many cocoa plantations... Uh, I see the chocolate that you tried, the Colombian chocolate, that was organic. Uh, I've been there to the plantation myself. I've actually seen it. I know the company very well. Um, however, it is very, very difficult to tell an organic tasting chocolate, an organic chocolate and a, uh, say a normal processed at the very top end. Um, if you know the tropical climate, if those who have been in the tropics, you know that you, you cut your finger, how long it takes to heal, there is always, they always use something somewhere. Though saying that, in Colombia, the soil was not fertilized um, as, as such, uh, but they couldn't make any particular claims for this, because uh, if they do, they would have to... Uh, pay a, a certifying company because their company was they have such a high turnover they would have to pay in a region of about a million pounds a year and they would rather use that uh, in their production and also to look after their workers uh, enable them to build schools uh, etc education facilities for the workers for the workers children it is we are dealing with the third world after all so the last chocolate you have here, which we're going to eat now before we go into the very, very last bit of this this evening, which is the quiz, is called Crudo. So, Keith, can you tell us a little bit about Certainly this, this particular chocolate? Uh, this, this chocolate, um, Centenario Crudo, was produced by Felklin for their 100-year uh, jubilee or centenary 
uh, about five or six years ago. Uh, it is, you may try it, please, while I'm talking. It is what your grandparents, sorry for the older ones, the younger ones, the great or the great, great grandparents, it is what they would have recognized as chocolate over a hundred years ago. This is made from a mixture of wild cocoa beans from Bolivia and a mixture of Criollos from the Maracaibo region and Venezuela and the Esmeraldas region in Ecuador. It's one of the earliest versions of chocolate. It was made in a primitive form. It was made in South America. The fire roasted beans were ground on a grindstone or what's called a matate and processed in a very simple manner indeed. Here we have something not dissimilar with its uh, coarse structure. The crystalline sugar is still very noticeable on the tongue. But the taste is intense, it's untamed, it's full of character. You can taste the coffee, cocoa, vanilla, nutmeg, and blackberry notes, all combined with the crystalline sugar. And this is a chocolate, or this is near to a dark chocolate, what your great-great-grandparents would have recognized. Did you enjoy that one? Yeah. I think this one's quite expensive, presumably, because it's yes, it difficult is. to get. Yes. Yes. So you're very lucky to have some. Now, there is a bit more in the bag that... Oh. Just... Okay. Sorry, um, I just we've got the microscope looking down the edge of what you're just tasting, and you can see that very very coarse grain structure, right? Which has crystalline chunks which look caramelly to me. I'm not sure that brownish color, of course, which is always what happens when you start warming sugar up. Let's just have a look at um, Keith. Help. Which one is this? That's the Madagascar. I think. Is that Madagascan? That's Madagascan. Okay, that's Madagascan. Um, and there's the Madagascan, which has a certain amount of structure to it, but is nowhere near as coarse. And you could definitely feel that in the mouth. The Madagascan is very smooth. This is, this is rough as an old rasp, and I love it. Um, well, on that very technical point, we're now going to move on to um, my friend Mark has been spending his hours beavering away looking for old adverts for you to do with chocolate. Now, if there is anybody that's of a sensitive disposition, this is the time to leave. Because the first question relates to these. You're going to, going to see four videos advertising chocolate. And the question is, if you can name the decades accurately, I might consider handing over some chocolate to you. Um, it's worth, it's worth, it's it's a, worth a, a go. Yeah. So you've got to be very quick off the mark if you think you know the answer. If you get it wrong, you leave and you don't get a chance for the second. Okay. So, though, so this, is the, this is an advert for a chocolate bar made by Cadbury's, and it's the Flake advert, and it's been going for about 40 or 50 years, and we've got four from, the, from four decades. Are there any miners in the room, by the way? <laughs> and, and what this, what this... We haven't really talked enough about the cultural in, uh, kind of role of chocolate. But this is one of the main themes, which is about sex. And these, these um, the, the, the kind of replacement of chocolate and sex, which I was trying to bring up earlier, and we were, I was batted away, I, I am now going to be allowed to indulge in. So here are the this four... Is serious, <laughs> this is a serious meeting here. Yes. But these are not in order, of course. You, so basically, at the end of this, we're going to ask those of you... So remember the order of these videos, and if you can say whether it's the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, in the right order, you could win some chocolate from Thornton's. OK. OK, so here's the first one. <laughs> One. Now, who knows what the gecko means? I've looked up about that and couldn't make any head or tail about it. This is two. I 
don't know what they are referring to there no. at all. It's a complete mystery to me. Only the crumbliest flake is chocolate. Tastes like chocolate, never tasted before. And the last one. Cadbury's flake. The crumbliest, flakiest milk chocolate in the world. You don't need to be a Freudian to really interpret that one. No. Uh, so I said earlier that fat is a feminist issue. Um, it's kind of interesting. I think feminism not, never got anywhere close to that. Um, <laughs> okay, so anyone confident? Oh! <laughs> oh, there's standing up going on, there's waving going on. This, just to remind you, this is the one that if you get it right, you get the two kilos. The one, uh, sorry, the one kilo of Cuban, but it's still pretty good. It's still pretty good. Sorry? Now listen, just when you thought that Mark was actually a serious scientist, this is what he does at his home a weekend, is collect erotic adverts. Right. Now, I have to say, so let's have some answers. We'll go for this man here with the striped shirt. 80s, 60s, 70s, 90s. Correct answer. Yeah. You can, we'll ask, we'll ask someone to, uh, it says one kilogram of Cuban chocolate. Run, run. Right, now the second, second question. Yes, you might get mugged going home. <laughs> by this lady over here, probably. <laughs> so the second question is, who can name three Quaker families associated with chocolate manufacture in the UK? That lady was up first. Round trees, Terry's and fries. We accept that answer. I don't know about Terry's. No, sorry. Yes. Round trees, cabbage and fries. I think is the answer that we had. That's we were looking for. I'm not sure about Terry's. We might have to split the prize. Is Terry, is Terry's was owned by Roundtree's, was it? No, I think were they, so. Were they original? Were they Quakers? Were they Quakers? Were they Quakers? You look, you look like to me you've been ever so nice. <laughs> <laughs> I could be really, really horrible now and say the man over there who asked, asked the question that no one could answer really deserves this prize. Or the person who answered it. What do you think? What do you think? What does everybody think? Do we give it to the man who asked the question? Uh, no. Uh, That's terrible. That is so sexist. I think, so this lady, we should give her a round of applause. That's the DVD, huh? So, the third one, which is a DVD and these two extremely rare chocolates made from wild cocoa plants is which country eats the most chocolate? Now you don't just have to get the right country. I also want to know how many kilograms per person on average they eat per year. Given I told you at the beginning, we in the UK eat seven kilograms per year and I can tell you we're not at the top. So that man was up really quick. Absolutely not. So, lady right at the back on the left, right at the very back. Belgium 11 is incorrect. So this lady over here. Belgium 9 is incorrect. Belgium 20? Belgium 20 is totally wrong. Listen, when we get to 10, I take them, okay? So, please. France 12. Japanese food, this is interesting. Right, we're gonna have two more, then I'll tell you the answer. And if nobody gets it with these two, the man 
who asked the question we couldn't answer, get to it. Germany 10. Germany 10. They are big, those two, yeah, but they're not. That's it. I, I want this gentleman to come up the front and collect his prize. He deserved it. Can you... The, the answer is actually Switzerland, 10 kilograms per person per year. Nobody said that. Somebody said Austria, 10. We had every other number and every other combination. Nobody said 10. So I think you deserve it. Because we're in... This chap, if we can give it to the chap up here. It's now. It's, it's, one thing, it's very interesting that the high, all the high consumers of chocolate, you would have thought it would be USA, but they are not in the running. It's Switzerland, Germany, um, Austria. Then it's France, France and Belgium. And then, and the, then UK. the UK. And then the UK. Yeah. And they're all in Northern European countries. And you think, well, why is that? Is it just because we can afford it? Or is, is it cultural? And it's, yeah, it's probably because of temperature. It's probably because it's cold here. So basically, chocolate can remain in shops and be of a good quality and last for a long enough time and, and be taken home and not melt all the time in our temperate climate. So we've designed this chocolate, really, to please us, to make this terrible weather that we usually have to put up with a little bit better. And so you've really got to remember that. Every time you put his chocolate in your mouth, it's an antidote to the grey, cold weather. <laughs> So on that, I think we've, we've come, unfortunately, to the end of a very interesting evening. You've seen everything from chocolate candles, um, erotic adverts, <laughs> and various other things. I think it really has been very good. And it really just leads me to say thank you to particularly Andrea and Mark for not catching the place on fire. Um, Keith, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us and, and this fantastic knowledge of chocolate. I think everyone's certainly enjoyed the chocolate. I'd also, once again, like to thank the Pharmacological Society um, really for supporting this and making it happen. And we will, as I said, do this again in a different form somewhere else very shortly. Um, my advice to all of you with the looming budget is what you've heard at the beginning. 3.5 billion is spent on chocolate. Go out and spend a bit more, then there won't be quite such a deficit. <laughs> Might be good advice. Um, and just to say that I asked you at the end of last year, what do you want to do? And we voted for chocolate. Well, we said chocolate. You seem to not disagree. Next year, we are going to do cannabis. <laughs> and we're going to do cannabis because I have found an organization which I can't tell you anything about, but you will hear about shortly in the press because they've just actually managed to get the first ever preparation of marijuana for treating multiple sclerosis. It will be registered in the UK shortly. And I've managed to get the man who actually grows all the cannabis plants to come and talk to us. And that my friends over here will tell you things about what's inside cannabis. And I think, if, unless you disagree, we've got some other ideas for the future. But so we're asking Cheltenham, please, because I suspect there'll be a lot of interest. Maybe you could get somewhere even bigger. Because I can tell you the plants themselves are quite big and we will be bringing a few along. So... On that note, again, on that note, Reed, just the to thank everybody again, yeah. and also to thank Thorntons for letting you out for the evening and to, to help us. It's been really fantastic, and we hope you have a safe evening, safe weekend, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>